Welcome to the Pint Glass Football Podcast. This is Pint Glass Football. We talk NFL and college football. I'm your host, Brad Fowler. Follow us at pintglassfootball.com. Subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. What's up, PGF Nation? We are back. Hope you guys had a nice holiday weekend. Some big games in the NFL that we got to get to. Ravens have a statement win. Cowboys lose on the road again. And more Week 16 takeaways. Plus, we'll break down the college football playoff games and make some picks with special guest Kevin Pryor. Our guest Kevin Pryor is predicting a blowout win in one of these college football playoff games. Might surprise you who he likes in this one, so be sure to stick around for that. But joining me to break it all down, my co-host, Alex Higdon. Alex, what is going on? Hey, Brad, what a wonderful Christmas gift. I and all Raiders fans receive. We're riding high. We're going to stay on that high. Let's go Raiders. Oh, man. I'll tell you, we're definitely going to talk about that game as well. What a game that was. There was some shocking wins, some big-time moments. So much football. How great was that? So much football over the weekend. That triple header on Christmas Day was such a gift. Unbelievable. Let's start with the biggest game. Ravens with the statement win over the 49ers. I think this was shocking for a lot of people. We knew the Ravens were a really good team. We knew this was going to be a really good matchup. I don't think very many people expected this type of performance from them, a blowout convincing win on the road. Brock Purdy comes out, plays his worst game yet, throws four picks, just too much to overcome for the 49ers in this game. 49ers head coach Kyle Shanahan said, Quote, I thought the first one was a big mistake, and the other three, quote, were pretty unfortunate for him. I tend to agree with him, Alex. Some batted balls that became big takeaways for the Ravens. But look, I got to give credit to Baltimore in that defense, though, because they got after him. They were in the backfield a lot on Christmas night. Brock Purdy was pressured on over 47% of his dropbacks. So they were consistently putting pressure on him, and it caused him to make some errant throws and really get this offense out of rhythm. Now, the Ravens' defense, I thought they did a great job mixing different rush and coverage looks, showing the Niners some things that they didn't have on tape, and taking away the middle of the field where I think the 49ers do their most damage. Yeah, Brad. I mean, from a betting aspect, the 49ers had ripped off six in a row, right? So from a betting perspective, I'm pretty sure I would love to see how the money came in on this game because I think they were due for a loss, and this probably got earmarked by some bettors on that. And then the other part of it is I'm not sure if the Niners have faced the physicality that Baltimore brings. As I'm looking at their schedule, the only other team that I could say is just a rough and tumble physical team. Well, two other teams. One would be Pittsburgh, and then the other would be Cleveland. Pittsburgh was the first game of the year, so I'll kind of throw that out. But then they faced Cle- excuse me, Cleveland. Cleveland is a very rough, typical AFC North style team that's a black and blue kind of division and that defense being the way that it is and Baltimore being from that same division. And we know what Baltimore always brings to the table, basically since they since their inception into the league, that they're a physical team. And I think that is a kryptonite to what the 49ers do when you want to get physical with them. I think they have some issues, never mind Minnesota and Cincinnati, but specifically the Cleveland win and that bought in this Baltimore win. Now, even, even though I went with San Francisco, I didn't expect them to lose by this much. And they were just completely dominated. They did not have a chance at all in this game. And I mean, if, if they, they just looked like he, we're here to make a statement and we are a real contender. And then on the other side of that, And I brought this up a few times and it's been something that we have not, we have yet to see from Brock Purdy. Can Brock Purdy bring a team back when the team is behind? The other times I asked this question about the three losses in a row that they had, everybody was talking about, oh, well, this person was out, well, that person was out. Well, then what was the excuse now? Because nobody was out. Of course, some unfortunate, the ball bounced off somebody, but they also have to play defense as well. 
That defense allowed 33 points. And from my perspective, first time watching that game, Lamar Jackson had all the time in the world. He didn't seem bothered or pressured or anything. Look, they're the number one seed in the AFC. They had the same record as the 49ers. This is a really good football team. And I've been saying most of the year that this team wasn't getting enough respect. I've said multiple times on this podcast, I didn't think Lamar Jackson has been getting enough respect. And they showed why they're a legit Super Bowl contender in this game. Because you're absolutely right. They dominated on the offense and defensive line. And that's not easy when you're going up against the 49ers who have a lot of big-time players up front. Kyle Hamilton, man, is he becoming one of the best NFL safeties? I mean, this guy has just, he's been awesome. And he was a guy that I circled last week when we previewed this game, Alex. He was all over the field in this game. 49ers were the number two scoring offense and the number one defense in points allowed going into this game. And the Ravens dominated. I, you can't say enough about how impressive of a win this was. Lamar was awesome. Zay Flowers was awesome. And the Ravens coaching staff, once again, I think deserves a lot of credit. They had a great game plan on both sides of the ball. This was the most impressive win of the year in the entire NFL. But even with this loss, and as ugly as it got in this game for the Niners, they still control the path to the number one seed in the NFC. And quite frankly, as lopsided as this was, I wouldn't be shocked at all if these teams meet again in Las Vegas. Yep. I mean, they look like they could possibly be on that collision course. But I think that I think the Cowboys will be the one, the team that have the same thing. We'll talk about them a little bit later. But I think they I think there's been some things that may have been a little bit, I don't want to say exposed, but some things that have always been there, just teams have just not honed in on it. And I think the Ravens honed in on we're not afraid of you we're going to come here and we'll punch you right in the face but i think this is the mentality teams have to take into playing the 49ers because there is a lot of finesse around this team they have some tough guys but the team is there's a little bit of finesse around how they do their offenses but i think if you go up there and you're not afraid and you punch them right in the face you can rattle them and cause them to backpedal a little bit more and gain an edge and move forward with that. But the other thing about this, to give one more thing to the Ravens, we have to talk about the receding after this week. And again, we'll talk about it some more, but we're going to have to talk about the receding of what where people were coming into this for MVP and where Lamar Jackson is now because he was not one, two, or three from a betting standpoint coming into this game, coming out, coming into this week, coming out of this week. I want to say, I believe, if I if I looked at it recently, I believe he is at number one. I believe it was last week or even the week before I said, look, this guy needs to be in the MVP conversation. And the fact that he wasn't up there as far as the Vegas odds, I thought was a huge disrespect to him. And you're right. I'm looking at it right now. Lamar Jackson is the odds-on favorite right now currently in Vegas to win the MVP after this game. It looks like McCaffrey at number two and Brock Purdy obviously took a couple steps back. This was a big-time win, no doubt about it. A huge game by Lamar and a huge game by this Ravens team. This was a big-time statement win. Cowboys, this is a team that continues to struggle on the road. Alex, this Cowboys defense, quite frankly, the defense made enough plays to win this game, and they slowed down that Dolphins offense. Miami had to settle for five field goals, but the Cowboys offensively just had a dry spell that lasted all the way from the second quarter to the first drive of the second half. I mean, they just could not get anything going. And when your defense is able to keep that Dolphins team, that Dolphins offense, I should say, out of the end zone the way they did, they only gave up one touchdown in this entire game. you got to put the blame on Dak in this offense. I'm sorry, when your defense has that kind of effort, you have got to get the W on the road and they weren't able to do it. I know the defense gave up the last second field goal. I get that. But the Cowboys offense didn't do anything until it was too late in this game. Yeah, Brad, you know, and I hate to be uh, be a, a dead horse here, the running game. You have to have some type of running game, and the Cowboys are missing tough the tough running that Ezekiel Elliott brought to this team. They miss it. It's clear. They cannot run the ball when you want to play. You're playing a team like the Dolphins. You know they're going to try and run up and down the field, and they have all this speed all around. I mean, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it rained a lot during this game. You needed to. You needed a mutter. Granted, the game was still close. 
They had an, they 1,000% had an opportunity to win. But I just felt if they had the running game that they needed, that guy in here that you could give 15 to 20 carries to that's going to get you about, let's say, 80 tough yards, just 80 tough yards, and just really take that offensive line and beat up that Dolphins defense and, tr- and try to put them into submission, I think they would have had a better chance here. But we can't take anything away from what the Dolphins did and how they did win this game. I mean, Terry Kill with nine catches, 99 yards. It's not like anybody went off, off in terms of that. CeeDee Lamb had six for 118. Nobody had a crazy game. This was a closely contested game. And it's really a bigger win for Miami than it is a worse loss for the Dolphins simply because what's the narrative been about Miami? They have not beat a winning team. And this is a team that's in the Super Bowl bubble in the Dallas Cowboys that you were able to beat at home to really give you some confidence going into the last two games of this season, which are going to be big. Specifically, you have a huge game as the last game of the season coming up against Buffalo. So there's a lot to be said for Miami and they deserve a lot of credit here because they needed this big win and they got it. Yeah. I just, I keep coming back to the fact that Miami, when we look at this offense, top passing attack and top scoring offense in the entire league, as well as a top five rushing attack. You know, this is a team with a lot of firepower, They could put up a ton of points, and I just can't give enough credit to Dan Quinn and the Cowboys' defense. I mean, they did a great job in this game. I know they gave up a lot of field goals, but that's how you win. That's the blueprint on beating the Dolphins. If you can keep them out of the end zone, limit them to field goals, they hadn't beat a winning team all season. Like you said, Alex, they had not beaten a winning team all season. These are two playoff teams that, quite frankly, I don't trust at all. I don't trust either one of these teams. It was almost like a game to show who's the bigger pretender. And Dallas showed again why they are. I don't believe in this team. I don't think Miami is is a team that's going to make any noise come playoff time either. But these two teams are, are, are almost like the same team. It's an AFC and NFC version of each other. They're good, but they don't ever beat anybody that's good. And they never win games that matter. Alex, your Raiders shock the Kansas City Chiefs on the road, what a game this was. Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs, I mean, they just could not create enough explosive plays. And look, that's been the story all season for them. And it continues to be the story for this team. They got pushed around by the Raiders in this game. Mahomes was running for his life most of the game. They struggled to protect him. His receivers couldn't get open. And the Chiefs just couldn't get anything going on the ground. Raiders defense was on fire. I mean, they played a heck of a game. They scored two touchdowns on Chiefs turnovers, a pick six, and a fumbled handoff on a trick play. Zamir White in the fourth quarter rushed for seven carries, 75 yards in the quarter, and put the game on ice. Really impressed with this Raiders team and what they did in this game. From the Chiefs standpoint, though, the Chiefs have now lost four of their past six games. This is starting to get a little bit alarming because now they're nine and six. They're out of the race for the number one seed in the AFC. Alex, is it time to hit the panic button in KC? Yeah, you're hitting the panic button if you're those if you're those players. You absolutely have to because this was a game we can explain the Philadelphia loss. That's a Super Bowl, you know, a team in the Super Bowl bubble and a payback game, quote unquote. The Green Bay game, we know a lot of people said that that was a trap game in the sense of right after that they were facing they were going to be facing the Bills, then losing to Buffalo, big game. They go back and they beat New England. I expected them to roll through after that Buffalo loss, I expected them to roll through the last four games, beating New England, us, Cincinnati, and then the Chargers. And that's a big loss in where we talk about what they lost us. And that's an that's an at home game. And Taylor Swift was there. So I think that's big it's bigger than what we think. Ha 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 ha. Oh but don't remind me. Yeah, I know. But okay, so let's just talk let's let me let me just talk about a few things. And this was the thing with the Raiders. This is the it's not about that the Raiders won. It's how they won. One, Josh Jacobs, who has been very effective against the Chiefs, did not play. You had Zamir White, and if you've been listening to this podcast, if you've been listening to me in any other space, I've been talking about, and I know this guy's measurables by heart. He was drafted in the fifth round out of Georgia, six feet, 233 pound, ran a 448 40, and we were not using him. And I have been banging the table to get this guy involved no matter what. But that was the one big thing that you spoke about. Seven carries, 75 yards, put the game away on that last big. I think it was like a 43-yard run to really ice that game, put it away. However, Brad, I text this to you. I said the Chiefs 
are desperate. And the reason I said they're desperate, Andy Reid was going into his bag of tricks more than once during this game. That fake sweep that Isaiah Pacheco scored on where he they had no quarterback and they motioned to him as a quarterback. Trick play. They also threw the fourth down pass of the punter, the punter making a pass to I'm not sure who the receiver was to get out of that. And then was and there's one more play that escapes me. Andy Reid usually doesn't show those until he gets to the playoffs and he really has to pull something out. And then the main thing about this, the Raiders scored twice in seven seconds on defensive plays. One by a fumble return, Bilal Nichols, you know, big man running with football into the end zone. And then another pick six, which was a bad throw by Patrick Mahomes, something that I don't know what he was looking at. Maybe he was just desperate to get the ball out. But this Kansas City, that panic, that panic button, I've hit that nine times. So this is a nine out of, actually, you know what? This is a 10 out of 10. The Philadelphia Eagles survive versus the Giants. Look, before we dive into it, I want to start just by giving some credit to to Brian Dayball because it's clear that this Giants team just continues to play hard for Brian Dayball. They made this a close football game versus a way more talented team. And you can tell these guys are playing hard and getting after it because of this coach and this staff. For the Eagles, this is a team that put up 465 yards of offense and 33 points. But there was really nothing impressive about this win. Alex, I still have question marks around this team. Jalen Hurts continues to turn the ball over. He threw a pick six that got the Giants back in this game. This Eagles team has become prone to turnovers and mistakes. It almost cost him again in this game versus a team that they should have handled easily. Like I said, this was a roster mismatch here. But here the Giants were hanging around in this game with a chance to win this game late. These last two weeks... They've played close games versus teams that, quite frankly, they should dominate. They lost to Seattle in a close game. They almost gave this one away against New York. I'm starting to really lose trust in this Eagles team. I wouldn't be surprised at all if we see a quick exit from them come playoff time. You know, Brad, I I hate to keep saying it. I've been saying it all season long that this team does not has not been able to put together a game. I don't know if they're this they don't look like the same team as they looked last year. And they got the rushing output that you would expect. 170 yards rushing. This was a very good rushing output from them. But again, there's a lot to be desired. I think in looking at this, there's a lot to be desired on the defensive side of the ball. And I think they needed a boost. And I thought I kept thinking at some point in time that this brain trust, who I think is who I think is very good, was going to at least contact either or or both Linval Joseph and then Dominic Kong and Sue to bring them in to kind of toughen up that defensive line because that's where the key is. The back end, they already tried. They brought in Kenny Byer. You thought he was sure it up, and he didn't. It's still Bradbury looks. We don't know what Bradbury's doing out there. And then Darius Slay has lost a step, and we know what the linebackers look like. So a lot of everything there, production and what they can do well, is really going to have to come from that front four that are the pass rushers up front. And at some point in the offseason, we're going to need to talk about Jordan Davis because this guy came in with a lot of hype. And when you look at the tape, there's there's another gear missing there. But, you know, again, to your point, kudos to the Giants. I mean, again, they're out here with Darius Slayton, Daniel Bellinger, and Wondell Robinson. Stop me if any of these people are on your starting starting fantasy, fantasy roster going into the playoffs. I, I, I beg to differ that they're probably not. And oh, by the way, Tommy DeVito was out in this game, and Tyrod Taylor had to come in. So he had to do this, keep this team competitive with two backup quarterbacks and a third string from the DeVito family as well in there. And, you know, Brian Dayball really, really has kept this team alive, kept them engaged all throughout this season, I think in reality, the Philadelphia panic button is another panic button. Even though they won, this panic button needs to be on eight right now. Alex, I'm with you because this is a team that just hasn't looked like the team from last year. And even though they've got a lot of wins throughout the whole season, it's been a lot of close wins. It's it's been a lot of come from behind wins. They haven't really just had any dominant performances. You have to go all the way back to week three versus the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to find a dominant blowout performance by this team. This is alarming. This is absolutely alarming. And we just got done talking about the Chiefs. These two teams were in the Super Bowl last year. And right now, I have all kinds of doubts that either one of them get anywhere near the Super Bowl this year. 
Lions clinch the NFC North first division title in 30 years. Pretty impressive stuff what Dan Campbell's been able to do with this team. Brian Flores in that defense really struggled to slow down the Lions in this game. The offense, they've got players. I mean, say what you want about this Lions team. That offensive line is elite. Jameer Gibbs had 100 yards from scrimmage and two touchdowns. David Montgomery had 69 total yards and a touchdown. Amon Ross St. Brown, 12 catches, 106 yards and a touchdown. I mean, this offense can be really explosive and put up numbers against almost anybody in this league. Nick Mullins got the start for the Vikings. I mean, he was able to move the ball. He definitely put up some nice yardage, but four picks in this game, really backbreaking picks that cost the Vikings any chance in this one. Lions defense, they really struggled at times. I mean, like I said, they gave up a lot of yards against this Vikings team, but they made big plays when it really mattered. Look, I still think this team has some flaws. I think they're far from perfect. I don't trust them on the road, especially outdoors late in the year. And I don't trust the defense on a week-to-week basis. And I think we saw that again this week. But once again, I got to be impressed with the job Dan Campbell has done with this Detroit Lions team. I think he just won Coach of the Year last Sunday. I mean, we have to put it in context, right? This is the Detroit Lions. The Detroit Lions. I just read that stat to open this game. 30 years since they've won this division. This is a franchise that, let's face it, has been a laughingstock in this league for decades. This guy comes in, builds a culture, builds a team with the recent draft picks and the moves they've made, and they've really got a competitive and really, quite frankly, a fun team to watch. But They've won a lot of games this year. I don't know what's going to happen come playoff time. I don't know how much trust I have from that standpoint. But really, just a hats off in a, in a big round of applause for Dan Campbell in this team because they've really had a heck of a year. Yeah, as much as I've talked about Dan Campbell being more, to me, more of a Jerry Glanville, Rex Ryan, he has created the culture that this organization, not team, that this organization has needed. He's created that. They've hired the right people around him and Ben Johnson and Aaron Glenn to get the offense and defense and do what they need to do. But I will say this about the game. I don't know if Detroit won this game or if Vikings lost this game. Because if you have four turnovers, the Lions, this game was 30 to 24. The other part of that is, yes, he threw the four interceptions, but he also threw for 411 yards and two touchdowns. They only ran for 17 yards the entire game. They ran for 17 yards. I don't care who goes to Detroit. Pick a team and put a team in a hat. Pick a team. Whatever team that they face, I do not believe Detroit gets out of that first round. And it's because of things like this that I can see from Nick Mullins coming in and throwing for 411 yards and you not being able to start stop the pass. We know when you get to the playoffs, you're going to be playing better coaches, better players that are not going to make the mistakes that Nick third string Nick Mullins made in this game. So the mistakes that were made in this game, they're not going to make when you get into the playoffs. And if you can't cover up and fix what you have on that defensive backfield that people can exploit, it's going to be grand opening, grand closing for this team in terms of the playoffs because they're not going to go anywhere if they can't stop anybody. Alex, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers keep rolling. Statement win for the Bucs. Look, we talked about the big statement win for the Ravens. This might be a little more under the radar statement, but a statement nonetheless. They dominate this game on both sides of the ball. The Bucs, now they still have some work to do if they're going to win the NFC South, but they've taken control of that division by winning four in a row. Baker Mayfield has eight passing touchdowns and zero picks in his last three games. He's playing some of the best football of the year. The Jaguars, on the other hand, wow. They're playing some of the worst football of the season, and when it matters most, the Jags turned the ball over four times. Trevor Lawrence threw two picks. He was terrible in this game. We talked about it off air. I know you've got some takes on it, but man, I do not like what I've seen from him at all. The Jags missed field goals. They failed on fourth downs. Look, this game, the Bucs simply outcoached them. They outplayed them, and it was wire to wire. Jags playing really just bad football down the stretch here, Alex, and the Bucs are peaking at the right time. 
this is a team that is playing with a ton of confidence right now. Yep. And you know, Brad, we have to really take a step back and talk about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in depth, if not this week, next week. Because if I'm not mistaken, I think we both picked Tampa Bay to finish last. And not only have they not finished last, they're in the driver's seat to win the division in Baker Mayfield. If you if you love stats, I'll give you a chance. Go take a look at Patrick Mahomes stats versus Baker Mayfield. I think you're going to be a little bit surprised at what you see and how good Baker Mayfield has been this year for this team. I think Baker has found a home. In fact, Brad, I believe that should be the Twitter poll of the week. Should Tampa Bay retain the services of Baker Mayfield on a long-term contract, let's say three to five years? Should they give him a long-term contract? I think that'd be a great Twitter question. However, on the other side of this wall, Trevor Lawrence, sunshine, as they like to call you. I'm talking to you, sir. I need you to realize this is the NFL. This isn't Clemson. This is not, this is not easy. I specifically watched you, sir. I honed in on you. I can tell with my non-professional eye, just a lover of the game and a person that loves to watch tape, you're not st- you're not in your playbook. Calvin Ridley too, but I, I, I'll hold off on him for a moment. But you, sir, you're not in your playbook. And I think a lot of what you're doing is winging it and when you get out when you get out there. And I'm seeing, and I've seen it consecutive weeks because we started talking about this and I started seeing it last week. And this week I decided to really, really, truly just focus on you. I talked about your offensive line and maybe that may be the problem, but I watched that offensive line outside of where they, there may be some leaks. You, sir, are not doing your checks at the line. You're not calling the correct audibles and you and Calvin really are not on the same page. I can't say if that's you or if that's him or maybe it's both of you. You need to recalibrate this offseason and figure out who you are and what you are to this franchise. Just because you're talented and you have a big arm and you are the number one pick, does not you do not deserve to get a big-time contract. This is not the NBA where they just keep players to keep players. They will move on from you in a heartbeat no matter who you are, even though you have an abundance of talent. But you need to get into your playbook because of this, a lot of this is riding on you and your future and your legacy in this league. And you've only been here three years and I'm already questioning your legacy and I'm questioning your intentions in terms of being in this league. So I'm very disappointed in Trevor Lawrence, who was a person I thought was going to take a huge leap this year. It's not the coaching. It's 1000%. This is all on you. Alex, you are absolutely right. And look, back on November 16th, I said on this podcast, Trevor Lawrence is overrated. He's a glorified game manager. And wow, the pushback I got from people on social media was crazy. I mean, you you won't believe how many people were telling me that I'm nuts, that that's a terrible take, ice cold take. You You wouldn't even believe how many people told me that was a terrible take. I heard it from every angle. Well, fast forward to where we are now, and that take is starting to age pretty well. Now, look. I think the guy still has a lot of talent. We've talked about him a lot in recent weeks, but we're talking about him because of the player he is and the he's the player he's supposed to be are not the same. And it's time for people to take a real look at this guy because right now he is holding this team back. Him not taking care of the football and not making good decisions with the football is hurting this team right now. Underdog fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports. I personally love the pick'em game. Just pick between two and five players to build a pick'em entry. Pick whether your favorite players will have a higher or lower stat total in this week's game for a chance to win big. You can win up to 20 times your money in a single night. Download the Underdog Fantasy app and sign up today with promo code PGF. That's promo code PGF. PGF to get your first deposit doubled up to $100. The official ticketing app of Pint Glass Football is now SeatGeek. I can't recommend them enough, guys. I've been using SeatGeek for years. You want to go to a game this season? SeatGeek is here to take the confusion out of buying tickets, making sure you get the best seats at the best prices. With SeatGeek, you'll never have to worry about overpaying for tickets again. How? They put a 0 to 10 score on each ticket, so you know you're getting a good deal. But here's the real game changer. You can get $20 off your first ticket purchase with the code PGFPOD. 
That's right, $20 off with code PGFPOD. This season, make every game day epic with SeatGeek. Download the SeatGeek app and remember to enter the code PGFPOD to grab your $20 discount. You know what's important when you're having a good time? Staying hydrated. And that's where Liquid IV comes in, the category-winning hydration brand that's fueling your well-being. With just one stick of Liquid IV, you get two times faster hydration than water alone, plus five essential vitamins to keep you feeling your best. And let's not forget about the convenience factor. The packaging is perfect for on the go, whether you're tailgating or just hanging out on the couch. But what really sets Liquid IV apart is the amazing flavors. Personally, I'm all about the Concord Grape and Lemon Lime. And with three times the electrolytes of traditional sports drinks, Liquid IV is made with premium ingredients to give you the hydration and nourishment you need. Get 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use code PGFP at checkout. That's 20% off anything you order when you shop Better Hydration today using promo code PGFP at liquidiv.com. Zencaster is the ultimate web-based podcasting solution. It provides high-quality audio and video podcast production and hosting. With a full suite of professional tools, podcasters can seamlessly record, produce, and publish studio-quality content all from one dashboard. Zencaster's post-production process takes the headache out of audio production. Set the right podcast loudness and levels while reducing background noise with a click of a button. Coordinating all your guests to record in person is painful and tedious. Easily invite up to 11 participants per recording with one click. Go to Zencaster.com slash pricing and use my code PGFP and you'll get 30% off your first three months of Zencaster Professional. I want you to have the same easy experiences I do for all my podcasting and content needs. It's time to share your story. All right, Alex, let's wrap up NFL Week 16 with the Game Ball. Game Ball this week, who do you got? The Game Ball this week, I have to give, want to give it to the entire Raiders defense because that was an impressive output from a team that we have always struggled with in the AFC, you know, in the AFC West for the most part since Patrick Mahomes has gotten there. We've looked like fools against them. Travis Kelsey has, you know, we've been the butt of jokes whenever Travis Kelsey is up. Everybody takes the over on all his numbers. And I'm not lying. That's really a true betting thing. As a whole, this defense really shut down the Kansas City Chiefs offense. So I want to give it to the entire Raiders defense. My week 16 game ball is going to go to Lamar Jackson. Look, he was the best player on the field on Christmas night on a field that was filled with star power. This guy rose above the rest. The 49ers, I mean, they just struggled to contain this guy. He was so patient. He picked his spots. He made so many big plays in this game, especially on third down. Extremely efficient throwing the ball. Had a 105.9 passer rating, 297 total yards in this game, two touchdowns, no turnovers versus one of the best defenses in the NFL on the road. Big time game, big time performance by Lamar Jackson. Alex, we do it every week. There's always a player, a coach, a ref, somebody in college football or the NFL that makes us say WTF was that. Oh, fuck. Now, Alex, you texted me like we always text back and forth during the games on the weekend. There was a game that really stood out to you, a specific moment in a game that stood out to you that made you say WTF. What was it this week? Listen, it was a game. Philadelphia won this game against the Giants, but there was a critical play, and I'm watching with the sound down because, as you know, we're running. I'm running my mouth on the phone with some people as the games are going on, and I watch Jalen Hurts towards the end of the half on a running play. He scrambles. He's about to run out of bounds. There's seven seconds left, and instead of they have no timeouts, and instead of running out of bounds, he slides. 
and I, I was completely confused. I thought maybe they had a timeout, or I was confused. I don't know why in any situation would you slide in bounds unless it's the end of the game. You're trying to have the clock run. Did not understand. Turned up the volume. The announcers were saying the same thing. Why did he slide? They don't have timeouts. Only to get saved by the fact that they had a there was a flag on the play. And oh, by the way, they were in the Giants' red zone, so it was a scoring opportunity, whether it was seven or three. If that flag does not get thrown, they do not get that field goal, and which was a very closely contested game. It could have been a difference on giving them the Giants' momentum going into half. WTF, Jalen Hurts, and the Philadelphia Eagles. What was going on there? That was a complete brain fart across the board. Hey, Brad, I know we're about to close, but I do want to say one thing, and it's going to pain me to say this. <sighs> Buffalo Bills, congratulations. We can move on now. <laughs> yeah, we, did, we didn't get to talk about the Bills today. We had too much other stuff going on, but... Oh man, Alex, I I think I think they might be making the playoffs and I know that was a team that you had what many would consider a hot take with them not making the playoffs and, and quite frankly that that prediction looked right most of the year. So to your credit, it really looked like that was going to come to fruition for a good stretch of the year, but in a desperate football team started playing like it and here they are in a position where more than likely they're going to get in. Excited to be joined by Kevin Pryor, a talk show host and co-producer at 950 Lounge Radio. It's a national radio show. You can catch it Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. Eastern. You guys cover a lot of different topics on your show. Bring on some great guests as well. But Kevin is also going to be starting a new sports show here soon, guys. So be on the lookout for KP on Sports. It's going to be on iHeart, YouTube, CatchCon, and Nubian Network. Looking forward to that show, Kevin. I see you on Instagram, Kevin, strolling the sidelines at major college football games <laughs> with your media credentials. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Excited to break down these college football playoff games with you. Kevin, thanks for coming on the show. Well, Brad, Alex, thank you guys for having me on. I mean, college football is one of my passions. Happy holidays to you guys and your families and uh let's get with the playoff i'm excited for this weekend yeah kevin i'm excited i want to start with alabama michigan Mm. this game is going to be a lot of fun vegas has this as a close line here michigan a two-point favorite there's some key matchups i want to look at and get your thoughts on one key matchup i think is going to be the alabama edge rushers versus that Michigan offensive line. Now, the Wolverines are going to be without All-American Zach Zinter, who suffered a leg injury versus Ohio State. He's a big-time player up front for them, but this has been one of the best O-lines in the nation the past couple years, but they're going up against SEC Defensive Player of the Year, Dallas Turner and Chris Braswell. I think, Kevin, the X-Factor could be J.J. McCarthy's ability to escape the pressure and keep plays alive with his legs what do you think about this matchup? What are you going to be watching for in this specific matchup here? Well, again, I think you hit it on the head, Brad. Again, like uh, SEC ro- royalty, these are t- and, and Big Ten royalty. These are two of the winningest programs, college football. Um, when we talk about again that you know losing um, Zenter will be huge on um, that All American tackle, but Michigan has the the wherewithal to continue to hold that thing together. I think, again, the big thing is because when we saw last time we saw uh, McCarthy play against Iowa, pass completion wasn't much. We know Iowa doesn't score a lot of points, but that was a concern point for me leading into this game. We know what Alabama can do. Um, this team has gotten better every every week. It's probably Saban's best coaching job in a very long time. I mean, this team lost to Texas pretty bad pretty much escaped South Florida, and now here they're on the playoff. So I think, again, that the key for me is, like you mentioned, McCarthy established some type of passing game. We know Blake Corm, but Bama's going to stack the box because they know they like to run the ball. So it's going to be, again, you know, the sports cars of Alabama against the Mack trucks of Michigan. Yeah, actually, I like that, Kev, the way you just described that. But I am with the SEC royalty. I mean, of course, I'm an SEC fan and where my Gators lie. So I'm not, no, I'm going Alabama all the way. And here is where I think the edge will be for me and where it will lie in terms of the future for what 
the next with whichever team comes out, but I'm going to Alabama. I'm just relying on Nick Saban and his coaching and his savviness to really dial up some things defensively that's going to put J.J. McCarthy, who I'm not sold on as the NFL product that people are when you look at some of the draft boards, how high they have him. Mm-hmm. I don't look at him in that sense, but and I think the we're going to find out a lot about J.J. McCarthy and his NFL pedigree going up against this Alabama defense. No, without question, Alex. Again, I mean, from the, a next level perspective, I'm not as high on J.J. either, but as a college quarterback, I think he brings a lot of intangibles to the table. He's definitely battle-tested multiple playoff games. Obviously, they haven't been on the positive side of those games but again he's battle tested he's a leader that team believes in him and I think again it's, it's going to be real interesting I mean this I mean this is the you know the Rose Bowl 445 if you know if you grew up in the, the northeast like I did you know that it was a special thing you, you made sure you watched the Rose Bowl now with this bigger significance of a playoff bid and the national championship opportunity on the line with these two teams it's going to be a special event this is going to be a really fun one. And I think a matchup that I'm also looking at, Kevin, is Alabama quarterback Jalen Milrow. Mm-hmm. We know this is a guy, he's got big time arm talent. Yes. He can hurt teams with his legs as well. He's a legit dual threat. He's facing a Michigan defense that is one of the nation's best. This has been a consistent defense that consistently has put pressure on other teams and slowed down offenses all year long. Jermaine Burton, wide receiver for Alabama, he's a deep threat for them. They have speed with Malik Benson, Isaiah Bond. There's some guys that could cause some problems for this secondary. How does Milrow in this passing attack match up versus that Michigan secondary? What are you looking for in that matchup? Well, again, the the, the uh, meteoric rise of Jalen Milrow. I mean, if, if we go back to the Texas game, you know, they benched him against uh, South Florida. And we, we watched him from that particular game start the – gradually get better and better and better. Tommy Reese, the offensive coordinator for me at Notre Dame, has done a fantastic job with Jalen Milrow to the fact that I think Milrow comes into 2024 as a Heisman favorite. But speaking of this game, um, Brad, when you think about what Jalen Milrow has on the side with Trey Burton and those guys, but that power front of Michigan, can he, you know, again, we know we he can throw the ball. We know he's very elusive. But can he take that power front? Michigan, to me, is the, probably one of the closest to a pro team in college football, especially out of the Final Four was left. They, you know, Harbaugh plays a very methodical style of football, not always pretty, but very effective. So the key for Jalen will be, can he avoid that pressure? Can he still get the ball downfield? Obviously, we know he's been battle testing the SEC, but the SEC has not been what the SEC has been in the last couple of years this year. So I'm very interested to see that power front of Michigan who can get to the quarterback. We see what they did against Ohio State and others. Will that be, again, an effective use um, against the Crimson Tide? Yeah, no, you know what? I agree. And it's going to be interesting to see because he's had a interesting and long road to this final four. I mean, if we were talking about him mid season, there was no, I don't think anybody was thinking about Alabama being in this position right now, especially with their early loss to Texas. There was no way that we were looking at Alabama finishing where they are. And, and though me and you, Brad spoke about this and said, we kept saying, watch Alabama backdoor their way into this final four. The more the season went along, the more I thought that that take wouldn't stand the test of time, but here we are. And they're here. I think this kid, feels that he has something to prove. And I think his legs are going to be the difference in this game specifically and his ability to get out of to get out of the pocket and do some things. Oh yeah. Well he's definitely again he's very elusive. And I feel the same what you mentioned Alex about Milro. I feel the same way about McCarthy. Been a, a very well decorated senior class Michigan's put together three playoff appearances. They had the heartbreak of the Georgia a couple years back. We know TCU and the cardiac kids they were last year beating Michigan and, you know, all the drama with Michigan with the sign stealing. I think the Wolverines have something to prove. And while they are a favorite and a number one seed, I think most people would probably feel like Alabama is that team. Alabama has been up to lately with Georgia, but Alabama has been pretty much one of the prizes of college football over the last decade. People will look at Michigan because of the sign stealing, because of Harbaugh and some of the things he has, his methods, and probably root against Michigan. But I, I'm, I believe in my heart of hearts, 
And um, I've been laughed at and people <laughs> said I'm crazy. I think Michigan beats Alabama. And I know we haven't got that. I'm probably oh, jumping the gun a little bit. But I think Michigan beats Alabama in this game because of that power style of football, controlling the clock. And again, you know, giving a different look than what Alabama is probably used to playing the SEC. Yeah, you know what? I can agree to that because I think it's the power versus power. I think there's not the level of physicality in the SEC. I think they have the the players, but I don't know about that level of physicality that Alabama brings. I think Michigan does bring that. And Which is so kind of crazy, right? When we power. talk yeah. about with the SEC, but it's right, exactly. true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I will say, and I'll say it again, and Kev, I've said it, and uh, Brad, you know, we've been, I've been saying it for the longest. That's the outlier aspect when you talk about Michigan, because I firmly believe this is Harbaugh's last year coaching. I said it yeah. before, you know, my mm-hmm. theory and my narrative. He put this out himself so he can get out of this and go coach the Chargers, but that's neither here nor there. But I believe this, there's that outlier piece that he knows that this is his last game. I think some of those players can actually feel that, and that's the outlier piece that plays into this game that could send them on a, on a roll to the championship. I, I totally agree. I think, again, uh, you know, obviously the NSA is not through with Harbaugh. He missed six games this year. Uh, even though Michigan has put together a, a 10-year deal, he hasn't signed it. I don't think he will sign it. And I think, again, if he wins the national championship, he can leave Michigan as, hey, job well done, mission accomplished. We've gotten the chip. I've done what I came here to do. I put this team back on top and I can go back to the NFL because the one thing I think Harbaugh really wants that he can't get in college, he wants a Super Bowl like his brother. And you can't play for a Super Bowl at Michigan. So I think, again, I think the players feel that. It's a veteran-laden team. A lot of those guys like Quorum and obviously, you know, we know Zinter is out, but Quorum, McCarthy, a lot of those guys came back just to take a crack at this thing. Those guys could have went pro, especially Blake Quorum as a running back. But these guys came back, and I think they know the deal with, with their coach. I think, um, you know, um, for what I understand, Harbaugh's very transparent with his players, even though it seems from the outside that it's always mysterious stuff. I think his players know the deal, and uh, I think they will rally around, and it's gonna, that's going to be a fantastic game on New Year's Day. I think you hit on something there, though. This Michigan team, no disrespect to Georgia or anybody else at Alabama face, but they might be the most physical smash mouth team that Alabama is going to face all year. This is a team that wants to punch you in the mouth. They play, like you said, a pro style game. They've got a lot of big time talent. They're going to match up pretty well against Alabama. As far as athlete for athlete, it's going to come down to coaching. It's going to come down to execution who makes plays on third down. All those things are going to matter in this game. I think it's a close point spread for a reason. Mm -hmm. Now you told me you like Michigan in this game. They're a slight two point favorite here. You're going with Michigan. Alex, I think you've got Alabama plus two, or are you going to take them out right here? Who do you like? I'm taking Alabama out right here. You know, I've been going back and forth on this for a while and looking at the matchups a little bit closer here. Kevin, I think I'm with you. I think I'm going to take Michigan here. I expect a close game. I expect this to be a really hard-fought game. As good as Alabama has been to get here, this is not the Alabama team that we've seen in years past. Yeah. This, this is not the, the team that we saw in years past that was a complete buzzsaw and basically blew out everybody on their way to national titles. But I'm with you. I think Michigan has been on a path all season long. You mentioned the seniors and the guys that came back. They came back for this one reason. I think this is a motivated and confident football team right now. I'm going to go with Michigan as well. Let's shift to Texas, Washington here. This is going to be a fun matchup, too. Texas has a loaded roster. You've got five-star blue-chip guys all over this roster, but its weakness has been pretty obvious this year, and it's been the secondary. They're going to go up against Washington quarterback Michael Penix Jr., one of the best quarterbacks in the country, and he has some big-time wide receivers to throw to in this game. Roma Dunze, Jalen McMillan, both are future NFL wide receivers. Adunze is a no-doubt first-rounder. I don't think McMillan will be too far behind him. Now, Penix leads the number one passing attack in the country going up against the 96th-ranked pass defense. So, Kevin, how can Texas handle this Washington passing attack? What do they need to do here to try to slow them down? 
Well, again, I mean, Brad, that's, that's going to be a Herculean task. You just talked about those fantastic wide receivers, and we didn't even talk about Dylan Johnson in the backfield. Penix is special. Here's a kid that, you know, from Indiana, uh, several knee surgeries, probably from his words, not mine, he figured he wouldn't play again. Kellen DeBoer was on that Indiana staff. He goes to, um, to Fresno State, then to Washington. He brings uh, – you know, with no guarantees, he brings Penix to Washington, and this team goes on a, a two-year run unlike anything, kind of reminiscent of the, of the, the Don James days at uh, Washington. So, again, I think this this game here, to me, is about that, that's, that Texas secondary. Can they contain Penix and those wide receivers? If for some reason they, they do play well in the secondary, who's going to stop Dylan Johnson? I I, I think, you know, no, no disrespect to Texas, I, I, I got blowout on this. I, you know, I just think that Washington is a team that is, you know, pretty much on all cylinders with really not too many weak spots. I think obviously this is a game that's not getting a lot of helium because of Bama, Michigan. But I think Washington it could be very scary. I think this is going to be a, a statement win by the Huskies in the Sugar Bowl. Yeah, you know what? This is the game that I went back and forth on. Again, being an SEC fan, I really wanted to just feel confident about Texas, but I don't. And it's everything that you just said, Kev, all the weapons that Washington has. And then what Brad said in terms of in terms of their defense being ranked in the 90s, that is a lot to overcome. I mean, the only true thing that I can say that I'm looking forward to in this game as an SEC fan is what Quinn Hewers is, because I hear he might be the, the guy that everybody's overlooking as a true NFL prospect. But I'm looking to see what he can do. Against he's going back Washington to school defense. as well. He's going back to school as well, but I'm looking to see if he's got that pedigree that he was that everybody was talking about. Mm-hmm. I'm looking to see that as well. But I'm also looking at Washington because I think this is really truly a statement game, not only for that program, but for Michael Penix as well and his future going forward. There's a lot of weapons on that team. They have a lot of beef up front in terms of that offensive line. I want to see them put it all together. And if I have to make a choice, even though I'm not doing them now, I'm still teetering. By the time we get to the end of this uh, segment, Brad, I'll probably have a, de- a firm decision, but I'm still teetering as we're talking right now. Yeah, I think he was <laughs> a fantastic quarterback. And, you know, to your, your point, I think he has the goods. I think the issue is that obviously he's susceptible to injury. He's been out a couple times this year. And their backup quarterback just went to Duke, Malik Murphy. So you know who's this another guy that's sitting there. Wouldn't that be great there? The Arch Manning comes plays in the, the playoff and saves the day. But I, I just think that obviously Texas has a lot of great things going for themselves. You know, Sarkeesian is, is dials it up well. I just think they're gonna be overmatched. Great team. Obviously, they they laid their hat on that um Alabama game, and probably the reason why they're in the playoff because they beat Alabama. Because obviously we know the Florida State debacle. Florida State probably would have got in if they didn't play Alabama, you know. So it worked out for Texas. But I just think that Washington is the more well-rounded team to get get the job done. And Penix, like I said, is special. Yeah, I think one of the keys here when when talking about Penix in this passing attack, I think the secondary is really going to need help from those big D tackles, Tavondre Sweat, Byron Murphy up front. Those guys are going to have to be difference makers in this game. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to speed Penix up and get him off his spot and get him uncomfortable in this game. Penix is a traditional pocket passer, something, let's face it, we don't see a lot of anymore in college football. Not a guy who's going to run around a lot, not a guy who's very elusive. He wants to drop back and read read from the pocket and get through his progressions. The way to stop that, obviously, is to get in his face and get pressure on him. And they're going to have to be able to do that up front. I don't think they're going to be able to afford to blitz much against him. I think it's really going to be dependent on that front four. If they can get home consistently and really help out that secondary, they've got a chance. But if Penix has time, I'm with you. I think he will pick apart the secondary because he is so deadly accurate, and those receivers are big time like we talked about. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned Quinn Ewers. I want to flip to the other side here. Quinn Ewers and that passing attack for Texas, they've been explosive this year too. They've Mm -hmm. got wide receiver Xavier Worthy. He is a big time home run hitter and a guy that I know Washington is going to be circling wherever he is on the field. But Ewers, he only has one touchdown of his 21 touchdown passes this year while under pressure. 
So I think the key to this matchup is getting pressure on him. This is one of those games where I actually think both secondaries are a little shaky. And I think this has shootout written all over this game. But I think Washington being able to get pressure on yours could be key in this game. What do you think of that matchup? You know, I really think Hugh is a special. I, I don't want to take anything away from him. But again, as a as a lifelong Jet fan, we know, hey, it is what it is. He gets hurt. He, he, he's, he's susceptible to injury. And I think, again, with Washington's front front seven, pushes up field. They do a great job with, with attacking. Again, you know, Worthy is a guy who will play on Sundays, but he needs somebody to give him the ball. I, you know, again, I mean, it's the playoffs and we want to see great football. I just think that this has an opportunity to really be a little bit of a lopsided game. I think the Huskies, again, just put the pressure in, you know, guys like Fuate and, and um, you know, uh, Trice and those guys, they they get after it. And I just think that um, Texas is, a lot of people don't see Washington, Brad. You're on the West Coast, so you see that. A lot of people in the Midwest and in the East Coast, they don't watch Washington. Those games don't end at 3 in the morning. The, the country is going to really see something special with the Huskies on Monday because that's a team I think even though they, they're great, they're undefeated, they beat Oregon twice, there's, not, there's a lot of mystery there, probably outside of Penix. I think that team will take that opportunity to really use that and fuel them. The fun team to watch. They can beat you any which way. I meant, well, obviously, we talked about their receivers. We mentioned Dylan Johnson. They have, I think, a guy who, you know, no disrespect to Jenny Daniels. I think, you know, Pennings to me should have won the Heisman. But they're a team that is fun to watch. They got a great coach and Kellen DeBoer and a really innovative staff that does some creative things. This game, to me, it could be very scary for Texas. Texas has to come out pretty quick, establish their situation early because if they get behind, it can be a long night in New Orleans. Kevin, I'm with you, and you hit on something right there that I wanted to address. Kayla DeBoer is probably the best coach that America doesn't quite know about. Correct. I mean, this guy is absolutely awesome, dialed in X's and O's. He's doing it. Look, I don't want to take away from their talent. They do have talent. We touched on that. They've got some NFL players on this team. There's no doubt about it. And it's not just the receivers and the quarterback. They've got a lot of guys on this team that can play at a high level. But if you look at that team, they're not loaded with blue chip five star recruits like the, these other three teams. Teams. Correct. You look at the rest of these three teams in the playoffs from a blue chip ratio standpoint, Washington doesn't stack up, but where they do stack up is with the head coach. This guy can really dial it up. He can call a heck of a game. He knows what he's doing. Some of the play calling, the innovation and the timing, the in-game adjustments, this guy just checks so many boxes. And for me, this is a coaching mismatch. Nothing against Sark. I think Sark is a good coach, a respected coach. But I think Kayla DeBoer is going to put on a clinic in this game. He's going to show them some things they're not ready for. And I think that passing attack is too much. And I also think, to something you hit on earlier, it's going to open up the run game. And I yes. think once you get both phases going for this offense, they're going to be a snowball going downhill. I like Washington in this game. Now, they're a four-and-a-half-point underdog. I'm going to take the four and a half points here with the Huskies. I think they get it done. You've said the word blowout a couple times, so I'm taking it that you're going to take them to cover and win this game outright here. Alex, have you made up a decision here? What side are you on? I, I, I think this conversation has swayed me in, in the likeliest of ways. I'm going to go at Washington. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, we, you know, again, and we, we talk about like the instance, they're the, they're, the, they're the underdog, right? They came into the Pac-12 championship 10-point underdogs, right? Everybody thought, you know, Oregon was going to call a nation. And, and I have some young people I know in, in that Oregon program. But, again, this Washington team is the Rodney Dangerfield to college football because they're in that Pacific Northwest. And if, if you're not following, you know, if you're not in the Pacific time zone, you're not following. And I think, again, you know, for them to even be, you know, to be an underdog to me, it should be even a pick them. To be even an underdog, I think, is a little bit disrespectful. And I think Washington's going to really show something. It's not the national championship. We know that. There's still work to do for, you know, whoever wins that game. But I think, again, Washington wants to show off themselves on the national stage. And I think they're going to do such. I think they win by at least by 10 and better. I like it, man. I like that take a lot. I like the bold take. I like all the takes I've heard today from our guest. Once again, Kevin Pryor. He is a talk show host and co-producer at 950 Lounge Radio. And be on the lookout, guys, for his new sports show coming soon. 
KP on Sports. It's going to be on iHeart, YouTube, and other channels. Kevin, thank you so much for your time. This has been a blast. Oh, man, I appreciate it, Brad. You and Alex are the best. I, I certainly uh, always appreciate you guys, Sports Ackerman. It's been really cool just chatting it up with you guys. Happy New Year. Happy 2024. And um, let's see some great football on New Year's Day. Alex, let's wrap it up like we do every week with the lock of the week. Alex, who do you got this week for your lock of the week? I'm taking the Patriots going up to Buffalo. They always play. It's an in-division game. However, when we're talking about betting, Buffalo is laying 12 points. That's a lot for me, especially the way that but that Bill is going to coach. He's going to coach this team out, and he's going to try and win every game as he goes out. And I think the Bills, if you look at their last few games, those games have been – Tightly contested with the exception of the Cowboys, which was a 31 to 10 win, but Philly was a 34 to 37. Chiefs was 20 to 17. Even the lowly Chargers, who almost, who tried to help me, they were listening to my prayers. The football gods heard me, but they beat the Chargers 24 to 22. 12 points is too much. I think that game is going to be a lot closer. And I'm going to take the Patriots. I'm going to take the, the Bills win, but I'm going to take the Patriots and the points. Alex, I'm going to take an underdog this week with the New York Giants plus six at home versus the Rams. Now, look, this is a letdown spot for the Rams. Plus, it's a trap game because they play the 49ers the following week. This game is on the road, cross country, cold weather, warm weather team going into a cold, nasty weather matchup. I think the Giants defense can actually match up pretty decent with the Rams offense. This game opened at Rams as a six and a half point favorite. The line has already moved down to six. That means that is sharp money moving that line because we know the public is going to be all over LA in this game. And I always say, fade the public. You want to win bets, don't follow the public, follow the sharp money. Tyrod Taylor took over the starting job. You had mentioned that briefly earlier in the episode, Alex. And I think it really gave this team a spark on offense. I mentioned earlier how this Giants team is still playing hard for Dayball. I like the New York Giants with the points here. I think they find a way to keep this game close. Yeah, I agree, Brad. And trap game is the perfect word here because they're going to be looking at that 49er game. But you know what, Brad? Before we wrap and get out of here, I just want to talk about two, well, rather just mention two games everybody should be looking out for. There is the Lions versus the Cowboys, which may or may not be a possible playoff preview and hence my words before and speaking about the lions wink wink and then there's also the dolphins versus the ravens which i think could be a game that the ravens could possibly lose but you never know but those are two games that everybody should be looking at coming up this week yeah absolutely those are going to be fun matchups big time matchups games to circle i know i'm going to be watching i think i'm with you alex I think I like Dallas in that game in a bounce back spot. They're going to be a desperate team coming off of another loss. And I like Miami in that spot too, because it's a letdown spot for Baltimore. I mean, let's face it. That was a big emotional nationally televised win versus the 49ers. Perfect letdown spot for them versus a still pretty talented Dolphins team. But guys, if you enjoy the podcast, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. I'm Brad Fowler. He's Alex Higdon. This is Pint Glass Football, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening to the Pint Glass Football Podcast. Be sure to subscribe and follow us on Twitter at PGF Podcast.